I'm Carla with Race to Walk, and thanks for joining. It is time for our Bible study, and today we are going to be doing a study of Jesus' parable of the rich fool or the rich land owner. But before we get started, a little bit about this channel. Here we share good thoughts about good words, and usually on Fridays, I host a live Bible study on Instagram at Race to Walk, and then I publish two videos a week. I publish a replay of that Bible study video with some study aids and a video about books. So if you are interested in either of those things, be sure to subscribe and like the video and share it with some friends. And um, if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to hit the bell for notifications so you get updates about new videos. So normally I do this Bible study on Friday, but since Friday was Christmas, I pushed it back a couple of days and we just took that day off. And um, so anyway, so we're going to do it today. Now, I'll tell you kind of a funny story. I don't know if it actually is that funny or not, but when I came on, I was thinking, oh my goodness, up Instagram updated the app and going live was not the same as it was before. So hopefully everything else works out okay. And then also, you know, we're almost to the end of the year. We've been doing the parables of Jesus all year. Um, I do have a, a page on my website at racetowalk.org forward slash Bible dash studies where I have a list of all the playlists of the series that I've done on Bible studies, but I was going through this. I wanted to make sure that I, I had covered all the parables of Jesus. And when I originally started this in the beginning of the year, I, I have like a little notebook that I keep on my, um, like kind of track what I'm going to be doing. And I made a list of all the parables and then I just started going through them, but I wasn't really following the list so much as I was just kind of going through them in series. And the issue is that this, um, my new living translation Bible, actually renames the parables. And so the parable, the name that I would put on my Bible study vid video was not necessarily the one that's on my list. So I literally went through every single cross checked everything to make sure I covered all the parables and there's two. So we're doing the parable of the rich fool today. And the next week we're going to be doing, what are we doing next week? A parable of the growing seed. So this one is just found in Luke, uh, Luke chapter 12. And we are going to be going over, I'm going to read just the parable alone, and then we're going to be going over the context of the parable, and then I'm going to read the parable in context. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But before we get started, let's just start this time with a prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for this day, and we thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity to study your word, and we rebuke every single thing that raises itself up against the knowledge of you. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit guides us and teaches us that we remove the scales from the eyes and the calluses from our hearts and give us ears to hear your word clearly. I thank all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, parable of the rich fool. Now, I have actually read this parable in connection with a few other parables in Luke, and this is one that's only found in the Gospel of Luke, and it's found in Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. So if you're, as you're listening to this, if you want to write, jot down some notes about what your thoughts are, um, we're just going to read the parable alone first, and then we're going to um, just talk a little bit about the context of it. So this is in the New Living Translation. Um, so you just might find it sound a little different if you're following along in a different translation. But verse Verse 13, then someone called from the crowd, teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you work for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with God. So that's the parable. The short answer to the question, what is the meaning of the parable of the rich fool, is you can't take it with you, right? So all of these things that we are so worried about, you know, that we work to accumulate, we can't, you know, when we go into eternity, that is absolutely meaningless. Now, one of the things as I was, as I was reading this, um, 
like I said, it's only found in Luke. So Luke's gospel is chronological. Luke was also um, probably the only Gentile writer. This is We believe that he's a Gentile doctor who was a companion of Paul. So he was the only Gentile writer of the New Testament other than maybe Hebrews. We're not sure who wrote Hebrews. So as I was, as I've been going through these parables, it's just, um, Luke is so much, he, it's just such a gospel about justice. And he really calls out people who are the, you know, the, that are exploiting others. So as I was thinking about it today, you know, Luke was a follower, a follower of, of Jesus. He had come to worship the, um, the Messiah of the Jewish people, right? But he was, he was not a Jew and he's in this, this, um, culture where there's a lot when he's writing and he's with the disciples, there's all this conflict and this turmoil, right? So there's this conflict between the Jews and the Christians. And so he is a a, a Gentile believer and, and he's seeing all this and, you know, he has believed in the good news and then he's in this, this, the society where the people who have said that they're followers of Yahweh, who at this point, it's probably before the, the temple was destroyed, who are the ones that are, you know, making sacrifices that, that are, um, administering the feasts and the, the offerings that not only are, have most of them, not all, but most of them have, um, rejected Jesus as the Messiah, but there's also so much corruption. And in the Bible study on the uh, Lazarus and the rich man, we talked about how um, a lot of people believe that the rich man actually was supposed to symbolize Caiaphas, who um, was the priest at the time, who the, the Sadducees and that whole family there, they were basically like the mafia. They were exploiting everyone, you know, everybody that came. And so they're really complete crooks. And so this is going on. There's, you know, persecution of Christians. Luke is giving his account and these people are acting, acting righteous. And he's telling all these stories. So listen to all these stories. I just kind of like went down my list of this, of the parables that we've done that only appear in Luke. So Lazarus and the rich man is only in Luke. Um, The unjust steward uh, is just in Luke. The parable of the talents, like, you know, being responsible um, and accountable for the blessings that we've been given. The the parable about the leaven. So the, now, I think it's also mentioned in other places, but Luke actually refers to it like twice in the the parable of the leaven. He speaks about the leaven of the, the, um, the, uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? So the parable, and I have a couple of short video clips on this. The leaven of the Pharisees is their hypocrisy. He explicitly states that Luke explicitly calls out the leaven of the Pharisees as hypocrisy. And then the the, uh, leaven of the Sadducees um, and of Herod is putting your trust in, in earthly government. So... Then he also, um, his is the only, only gospel that has the parable of the Good Samaritan, which we have a, a video, a Bible study on that. And remember the Samaritans were ones that the Jews thought were like total scum. And, um, Luke puts him as the, the hero of the story and then is explicitly showing the, 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 uh, I think it was the, was it a Levite and a priest that passed by? And so he's calling the religious leaders out specifically. And then a par- the parable of the prodigal son and the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. So in this parable, he there's the, the Pharisee, you know, this teacher of religious law who is giving this really prideful um, prayer. And then there's a tax collector who is humbling himself before God. So he's not even, you know, a lot of times in parables, there's, uh, you know, there's hidden meaning, you know, s- stories can be subversive. Luke's not really being subversive, subversive at all. He's like straight up calling people out. So keep that in mind, like all these other parables, because this, this parable actually, uh, co- is given in the gospel of Thomas. And I want to read some of the comments on that because I, I just think it's kind of funny, but, and there's a point to it. His whole gospel is he's just doing like hit after hit to all these hypocrites 
that are that not only not only deny Jesus, but also are um, just really you know they're exploiting people. They're they're corrupt, and you don't have to believe Jesus to know that that is completely against God's laws. I mean, go read the Book of Amos. It's pretty much if you want to compare two, you know, Luke, the Gospel of Luke and Amos, they're pretty much saying the same things. They're calling out the wealthy. They're calling out the rich. They're saying judgment is coming because you're exploiting people in need. So anyway, I found this really, really awesome article because I was, as I was reading this parable, I'm thinking there's got to be somebody specific that, that is being referred to in this parable. Like, you know, in the parable of Lazarus, Lazarus and the rich man, it was probably Caiaphas. Who is he talking about in this parable that is just taking everything and storing it up? So, um, I found this really awesome article called the I'll link to it when I republish this in the description. It's called The Holy Land in the Time of Jesus, and it's on CatholicIreland.net. It first appeared in um, a publication called The Messenger by uh, Catholic Jesuits. And as I was reading this, I was like, you know, isn't it just awesome that we live in a time when this information is so accessible? Like, we, we can listen to sermons, like, from pastors all over the world. We have such easy access to all these, you know, great teachings, you know, anything that's published, you know, from before the time of Christ, we, we can have access to these writings so easily, so easily. This is just such an amazing time that, you know, in all of history, this has never been, um, it's never been, this information has never been so easily accessible. And so we really have no excuse for our ignorance do we? So if, if we have a question about something, we can seek it out. And and there's really not that many obstacles. There may be some things that are behind paywalls, but usually you can, any question that you have about something, you can usually find the answer to it. So this was actually written in um, November 1989, and it's a lot longer, but I, I'm not going to read the whole thing. But there were just a couple things that I wanted to um, to highlight. So he's talking about the the Roman world. So the time Jesus was um, in Judea, it was under, it was a Roman province at the time. And there's, um, this is, he's talking, the, the article kind of sets the stage for the different um, governmental divisions in the Roman Empire as well as over Judea. And then it says, a Jewish king complained to the emperor in Rome about Pilate, and accusing him of insults, robberies, assaults, executions without trials, and unending cruelty. On one occasion, when the Jews opposed Pilate because he used money from the temple treasury to build an aqueduct, that is, a construction for supplying water, he had his soldiers mix with the demonstrators and cruelly beat them. Into such, into such a violent world, Jesus was born. So... You know, this is just kind of setting the picture. So I think that when we read the when we read the accounts and the parables, sometimes we I think have this sort of fantasy idea of what was really going on at the time. But these words were spoken and these gospels were written to people who who were living in a particular place in a particular time. And they had specific circumstances around them. And so we can't really grab the full weight of it unless if we understand what those circumstances were. And this is a really good overview of explaining what that is. Um, and so then they go into this whole explanation of what was going on as far as um, trade routes that were opening up. So actually, I was just telling somebody the other day, like this is, we're talking about the dating of the birth of Jesus. And um, there was actually one of those trade routes was actually, this road was actually finished, uh, wasn't finished until 6 BC. So I've read different journal articles that have said that um, the the Romans would not have been able really to administer any sort of census before that time, because before that they were actually in a war in Syria. And then after that, they, they finished this trade route. So this is one of those things. It's like all this stuff is, is going on. Um, and so when those trade routes opened up, then there was a lot more trade and commerce and it, it created the emergence of a, a wealthy middle class who were in a position to profit from new possibilities. Um, many Jews immigrated at this time to seek better conditions and greater wealth. And so many Jewish communities were established abroad and flourished. Uh, some, however, sometimes, however, there was unemployment in the cities. The peasant farmers were squeezed out of existence by competition from large landowners and heavy taxes 
were levied for the support of a bureaucracy. The, this continued in the time of Jesus and was made worse when the occupying armies took over some of the land. They A little bit farther is talking about Herod the Great specifically. So Herod the Great had d died not too long after um, after Jesus was born. So one of his sons was uh, over... They actually divided in Herod the Great's region into four different regions and assigned people. So um, the Romans... And the rulers appointed by them, such as Herod the Great, continued the policy of extreme exploitation of the land. Great estates forced back the peasant farmers and the number of landless tenants increased, particularly after the time of Herod the Great. Great estates in Galilee and other places were owned by the Jewish aristocracy of Jerusalem or, in particular, by the Sadducees. And so this is what the, the uh, Lazarus and the rich man is kind of speaking into that same situation. So when we read this, this is this kind of indicates this this taking of maybe what other people had, right? So in verse 17, he said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have enough room to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. So... This is kind of the sense of like taking, you know, pushing out other people to accumulate for yourself, right? And this is, and as I was thinking about it, I was thinking, okay, well, maybe he wasn't speaking about a spe specific person, but just in general what the situation was going on, because, you know, it sounds like that was going on among a lot of people. And so here's the thing that, um, especially for, you know, I know that. Only about half the people that watch this video, these videos are in the U.S., but you know, in the U.S. specifically, we have this, we've kind of made an idol of laissez-faire capitalism heavily. And sometimes I see people um, talking like they think that, you know, capitalism is aligned, like, goes hand in hand with Christianity. And that if you say anything against capitalism, that you're speaking against Christianity. I don't know if that you can you can actually read the gospel and come away with that. When you look at the accounts in the New Testament and Jesus's teachings, he's basically telling them to listen to uh, obey those in authority. You know, even when those in authority are in the wrong, like when it's uh, he says if someone compels you to go a mile, go two, and that's like an like an unjust judgment, right? So he's just saying, he's saying, give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, give unto God the things that are God, that he was telling them to pay their taxes. And if you read this, the full, all this article, it actually says those tax burdens were very, very heavy and very oppressive. And Jesus is saying to still pay them. So he's not talking about revolting against this government, even though the government is wrong, right? But if you go back and look in Leviticus, it's more about um, the, just the, the way that the the Levitical laws are given that are giving instructions on how to, it's not just about offerings, but it's also about, you know, setting up uh, the justice system and the courts and how to decide just certain things and also how to operate, you know, in business. There's, there's a lot of, there's actually a lot of laws in Leviticus for that. And so the Levitical laws are really more closer to distributism than they are uh, lazy power capitalism. And so I think that's something, you know, as Christians that we need to keep in mind. So we kind of get, uh, you know, in the U.S., we kind of get set into we're in these certain little groups. And we think that because these certain little groups have a platform and, or position, that that must be right because we call ourselves Christians. Well, guess what? Sometimes what we do as Christians isn't actually right. And so just because we do it doesn't make it right and doesn't mean, make that it's pleasing to God. So I wanted, wanted to say about this is that, this was a time when the economic system was sh shifting, right? So there were new classes of people coming into wealth and power. And so there's all this turmoil. It's, it says a little bit later that there was all this, you know, poverty and oppression and exploitation. There was this sort of civil unrest, you know, that was bubbling underneath the surface. And this is, this is the time that Jesus was born into. And so who is he speaking to? Is he speaking to the Romans? No, he's speaking to the Jews. The, speaking to people who say that they follow God. That's who he's speaking to. So even though these Jew, the Jews are coming into these positions of power under the Roman government, he's still saying he's especially, I mean, he's just like completely, you know, throwing this in their face about, you know, you're, you're not, 
It's really calling them out basically all the way through his gospel. So what happens? What happens? So 40, 40 years after Jesus' death and resurrection, the temple is destroyed and they're dispersed. There's judgment. There's judgment. And if you go back and look in the book of Amos, you know, this is, Amos is coming to them saying that you are, you know, you, you are exploiting people, you're oppressing the poor. Um, and so there's going to be judgment. And, and this is really a good parallel between the two. But we see this sort of thing happening all, all the time, right? So if you go back and look, um, you know, in the history of the Western culture, you see this repeatedly. There's, you know, there was a time when, you know, we were in a feudal system and then the nobility and they oppressed and exploited. And then there's this big uprising and an upset and sort of a reset. So looking at the French Revolution specifically, you know, they think that it's the nobility. And so if they change the, if they get rid of the nobility, then things are going to be just and more equal, right? And then what happens? And then what happens? Then you get people, you know, the merchants and the people who have control of great control of this wealth. And the same thing happens. You have, you know, go read anything by Charles Dickens. And you can see this picture of the exploitation of the poor, exploitation and oppression of the poor. And so now we're coming into the same sort of thing again with this technological revolution where 500 years ago, you could only control certain, you, there were limits to what you could control, control, right? And so now there's really not. I mean, there can be this vast accumulation, not just, and there's no geographical restrictions. It can be widespread. So you look at like people like Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world. And, you know, what did he do at the beginning of this pandemic? He slashed commission rates for thousands of his affiliates to you know, next to nothing. And this was right in the shutdown and gave him seven days notice because obviously you know, being the richest man in the world, it's not enough. And that's what he's saying. It's, it's never going to be enough. If your focus is on wealth, it's never going to be enough. You're never going to have peace because there's no end to greed. When you let greed get a, get a hold of you, there's never enough to satisfy avarice. And so there never comes a time where you can say, now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And we see this repeatedly. But what what is the message here? So Luke is going into speaking to people who are exploiting with the permission of the Romans, right? And there's no recourse. There's no justice. But he's saying here, uh, but God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything that you worked for? So Luke is saying, you may think you're getting away with it, but there will be justice. And he's speaking to his situation. Now, I want, I want to read, before we read the whole context of it, I want to read what the, the passage from the Gospel of Thomas. So the Gospel of Thomas, there's debate about when it was written. And the Gospel of Thomas is um, 114 sayings. Most two-thirds of them are, you can find them in the Gospels. They might be tweaked a little bit. And then the others are uh, not found in the gospel. So there's debate about what it is. And people who are really pro-Thomas sayings, they say that this is more original and authentic to than the actual gospel. So they think this is earlier and that the gospel writings are later. Um, the gospel, they're very Gnostic uh, in in their focus. They Gnosticism saw salvation in knowledge rather than in the salvation of God. And so you'll see that theme all the way through. Now, uh, I'll link to this. There's um, This is on early Christian writings. And what's cool is it will give the Greek and then also three different translations as well as quite a few different commentaries on the passage. So I'm going to read this, um, just one of them. This is Blatt's translation. Jesus said, there was a rich man who had many possessions. He said, I will use my possessions to sow and reap and plant, to fill my barns with fruit, that I may have need of nothing. Those were the thoughts in his heart, and in that night he died. He who has ears, let him hear. Okay. So it's pretty close, right? Just a little bit off. So this is a commentary by uh, Joachim Jeremias, and he writes, The closing sentence, too, of the parable of the rich fool. So foolishly believes a man who heaps up treasure for himself and does not gather wealth towards God. Luke 12, 21 must be an addition, must be an addition. Um, it is missing from the gospel of Thomas and gives a moralizing meaning to the parable, which blunts the sharp edge of the warning. 
So because it's moralizing, he doesn't think it's original. I'm going to read another comment on this. Okay, Helmut Kostler writes, There are two secondary features in the narrative of Luke. The conclusion and the moralizing discourse. Both are missing in Thomas's version, which presents a story in the more original form of a reversal parable. On the other hand, Thomas has also transferred the parable into a different milieu. The rich man is no longer a wealthy farmer, but a decurion from the city who wants to invest his money successfully. The maxim at the end of the Gospel of Thomas 63 is, of course, secondary, but it does not reveal any knowledge of Luke's conclusion. So what they're saying is basically we don't think that we think that Thomas is more original because it doesn't have a moralizing parable. And I just have to say that. Have you read the rest of the Gospel of Luke? Because Luke moralizes a lot. So um, also, I I think that it it really Luke's Gospel is more consistent with the Old Testament, too, because if you have read any of the prophets, they are pretty plain about telling people that you know, God's going to hold them to account. So I don't think that that's a valid conclusion on their part. It's a conclusion that they just want to make. Um, the, the other thing about this is that to me, again, this, this fits into, um, more with the Gnostic understanding of just about knowledge. Luke's gospel is like, it's, you can't just, and it really, I think ties into the, his whole theme of, putting it to the religious hypocrites, it's like just saying and knowing means nothing you have to do. And so with the Gnostic version of it, it can just stay in your head. It can just think of, you can just think about it. Luke is being very clear about knowing that there will be judgment and you will be called to account for your actions for what you do. So anyway, um, I just wanted to bring that in because I like sometimes, I don't know, sometimes people like will come across um, commentary on the Gospel of Thomas and think it's like something gotcha. And it's not. I mean, it's just what to you, uh, if you read the the Luke's account versus the Gospel of Thomas, which to you sounds like a better fit into the situation that was going on in Judea at the time of Jesus? Which is a better fit? I think Luke's is a better fit about speaking to what was actually going on. This Thomas's is completely divorced from any actual setting. So I'm going to read the what's around the gospel, uh, this particular parable. This is um, titled, Jesus Speaks Against Hypocrisy. Okay. Meanwhile, the crowds grew, this is verse 1, until thousands were milling about and stepping on each other. Jesus turned first to his disciples and warned them, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, their hy hypocrisy. So maybe this is, maybe he's speaking to some of the religious leaders at the time about what they were doing, you know, uh, and taking advantage of those around them. The time is coming when everything that is covered up will be revealed and all that is secret will be no made known to all. So all these secret dealings, all the underhanded stuff is going to be revealed, right? No one will get away with anything. Whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have whispered behind closed doors will be shouted from the housetops for all to hear. Dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot do it any more to you after that. But I'll tell you whom to fear. Fear God, who has the power to kill you and then throw you into hell. Yes, he is the one to fear. What is the price of five sparrows, two copper coins? Yet God does not forget a single one of them, and the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. And so, you know, just reading that, just think about the situation today where there's all this pressure to um, to cave, to do what you, it may not be like a big wrong, maybe it's just a little wrong, a little corruption, but there's pressure to do that. And so what is Jesus saying? He said, don't fear man, fear God. You know, you have to remember that whatever you do, you're accountable to him. You're accountable to him for your actions. And he's giving a very explicit warning. Fear God, who has the power to to kill you and then throw you into hell. All men can do is kill you. That's the worst they can do. Either you also be thrown into hell. So do you think that this moralizing, as these Gospel of Thomas scholars think that Luke is doing, do you think that's out of place with this? No, no, I don't think so. It's also not out of place with the Old, Old Testament either. 
Okay. I tell you the truth. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, the Son of Man will also acknowledge in the presence of God's angels. But anyone who denies me here on earth will be denied before God's angels. Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And this actually, I think this is a good, um, I'm going to tie into this. This is a Second Timothy 2. This is considered one of the earliest creeds of the church in Second Timothy. Um, this is Second Timothy 12 through 13. This ties in exactly with what Jesus is saying. This is a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure hardship, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. Then in this part, he says that anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be, will not be forgiven. Verse 11. And when you are brought to trial in the synagogues and before rulers and authorities, don't worry about how to defend yourself or what to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what needs to be said. So he's talking about, you know, worry about, you know, worry, fear of man, um, about persecution, about this pressure. He's like, don't worry about that. The Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. And then he goes into the parable of the rich fool. Then someone called him from the crowd, teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, friend, who made me judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced five crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you work for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a relationship with God. So the other thing, I'm going to read a little bit further because this is, goes into teaching about worry. But um, he talks about, um, if you go and read, look at the Bible study we did on the parable about the uh, building on a solid foundation. So Jesus is referred to the cornerstone and, you know, solid rock, right? So that's the illustration. But in that particular parable, what he's referring to is the works that we do. So what kind of things are we doing? Are we building, that's building our a foundation of for eternity. So that is, I'm not going to go into more detail on that one, but that's also ties into that here. Okay, then in Verse 22, then turning to his disciples, Jesus said, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear for life is more than food and your body more than clothing. Look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for God feeds them and you are far more valuable to him than any birds. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if worry can accomplish a little thing like that, What's the use of worrying about over bigger things? Look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? And don't be concerned about what to eat and what to drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything you need. So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven, and the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it, and no moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning, as though you were waiting for your master to return from the wedding feast. Then you will be ready to open the door and let him in the moment he arrives and knocks. The servants who are ready and waiting for his return will be rewarded. I tell you the truth, he himself will see them. Put on an apron and serve them as they sit and eat. He may come in the middle of the night or just before dawn, but whenever he comes, he will reward the servants who are ready. 
Understand this, a home, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would not permit his home to be broken into. You must also be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Peter asked, Lord, is that illustration just for us or for everyone? And the Lord replied, A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But what if the servant thinks my master won't be back for a while and he begins beating the other servants, partying, and getting drunk? The master will return under announced and unexpected, and he will cut the servant in pieces and banish them with the unfaithful. And a servant who knows what the master wants but isn't prepared and doesn't carry out those instructions will be severely punished. But someone who does not know and then does something wrong will be punished only lightly. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. So, you know, this, this whole thing is about using what we've been given responsibly. So in the parable of the, the rich fool, he's just taking things for himself. He's not concerned about others. But in the, the further on this passage, he's saying he'll be severely punished. And the thing to remember is that, you know, if you're a Christian, at like, so like we've talked about it a few times, and you know, there's a lot of people who think that, you know, business, doing business is amoral, that, you know, ethics and, you know, God's laws don't apply, that whatever you can get away with is fine. That's not the way it works. And there will be accountability. And if you're a Christian and you say that you follow God and you're doing these things, you are going to be judged more harshly because you know better. Because you say you know better, because you say you follow God. This is what it says. If a servant who knows what the master wants, but isn't prepared and doesn't carry out those instructions, will be severely punished. But someone who does not know and then does something wrong will be punished only lightly. So you have a greater responsibility as a Christian to behave ethically, to you know be just in your dealings with others, to you're accountable. You're accountable because you have the Holy Spirit living within you, in you, and if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, if you silence that Holy Spirit, if you don't respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, then you're going to be judged. You're going to be judged. And so, I uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I was going to pull this out, and I didn't. And so, there's a, I think it's the Shepherd of Hermas. There's a, there's this whole long thing about the rich and the wealthy, and that they he basically in his position. So keep in mind, this is like first century writing. They basically feel like if you are wealthy, then you have less access to God because your wealth is kind of like in a um, kind of a barricade to it. But as you give to the poor, then the poor will, you know, pray to God, thanking you for those blessings and that God will respond, will bless you because you gave to the poor. And so that's kind of indicated here a little bit when he's saying that, you know, sell all you have and give your possessions to the poor and then you'll have treasures in heaven. So um, I think that we need, especially in the U.S., in the, um, you know, we, we've been so comfortable and we just have gotten, I think, our, our um, we've gotten our perspective off. We need a course correction, I think. And I think we need a heart check about, you know, what is really, um, what really are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be caring for those needs and we shouldn't be using our position to, um take advantage of other people. And again, if you're a Christian and you're doing that, you are going to be held. There's going to be more consequences for you than for somebody who isn't. So anyway, this parable of the rich fool, I've been a lot of rich fools, right? And we have a lot of them today, but in the end, there's going to be justice. And uh, what's kind of interesting to me is that, that there's so many people who make a big deal and a big show about being, um, being a Christian and they're some of the biggest, uh, biggest crooks out there, biggest crooks. And so really I, I, you kind of almost have to wonder, like, are they even Christians? Are they just really doing this for like connections and networking? Because they're, they really act like they don't think that there's going to be an, any judgment for their actions. I mean, I think, you know, when you look at it, atheists may not believe in God, but I think that they may, sometimes they have more of a sense of accountability than Christians who think that they're right in their actions just because they say that they follow Christ, but they don't actually. So anyway, just keep that in mind. You know, we have, you know, we need to, um, 
It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So we need to make sure that our actions are pleasing to him. So I don't know. We have a lot of crazy stuff going on right now. And I think that if even a fraction of the people who say they're a Christian started actually act, acting like it, things would look a whole lot different. But anyway, let's just end with time for the prayer and we will call it a day. Lord, we thank you so much for this day and for this time, Lord, and give us clean hearts. We ask that you pour out your spirit of grace and supplication on us, on our churches, on our communities, and on our nation, Lord. Give us clean hearts. Um, Lord, we need you to cleanse us and to to rip away this, this spirit of apathy and um, this callous behavior towards people around us and give us hearts that are really seeking after you and that are ears that can hear and are sensitive to your leading Lord. Um, we thank you Lord for every single blessing that you've given us. And we thank you for your grace and forbearance on just, uh, on every single one of us. When we've, we've been so, um, lazy about the gifts that you've given us. I pray for the favor and blessing of God over each person that listens in Jesus name. Amen. Anyway, I hope you had a great Christmas, great weekend, and uh, I'll talk to you later.